as businesses place more and more information that is considered critical for the health and life of the business onto a network, concepts like availability and specifically high availability, these concepts become critical for us. In business, we're going to take a bird's eye view. In fact, higher than that, we're going to take like a 747, a Boeing 747, 35,000 foot view at this availability concept. These terms of high availability and fault tolerance, they're so often used in the networking industry that you'll often see them abbreviated as simply HA and FT. So be aware of that. Now, availability, what this really means is best demonstrated, I think, for you, especially when we contrast it against reliability. These are often confused terms. So let's begin with a discussion of availability. So let's say this is a storage area network that I build for my organization. Inside the storage area network, we have these storage nodes and they're all connected with some real high speed technology like fiber channel, for example, or maybe even fiber channel over ethernet, which would allow speeds of like 40 gigabits per second. So this is great stuff, this sand that we've built, but we wa often want to be concerned with how available is it? So how often when network users go into the SAN over the network to get data, how often do they actually succeed? That's the measure of availability. And high availability, therefore, is to make this availability sky high, like maybe the downtime is measured as only like 10 minutes out of an entire year is that SAN unavailable. But something else that we should consider here is reliability reliability. So one of the things I want to propose to you is sure, it's great to have the SAN always available and it's also great to make it reliable. Now, what does reliability really mean? Well, if we're telling our users that we have this 40 gigabyte SAN for them to take advantage of and realistically, let's say it operates at about 30 gig realistically most of the time, and that's still blazingly fast, reliability is that measure of, okay, how often is it performing like this? So notice that it's great to make it always available, but it's also great to make it very reliable and operating the way it should. A lot of times we'll have fault tolerance mechanisms in place so that if something dies, the other devices can fill in for that dead device. But many times this sacrifices reliability. So sure, it's still available, but reliability suffers as a result of the kicking in of the fault tolerance mechanism. Fault tolerance is techniques that we can use to improve availability. An example of fault tolerance might be two big multi-layer switches that you have on the network, and you could set up fault tolerant links between them. So I design four links between these two devices so that if one link dies, there's other links that can take over. And inside the multi-layer switches, I might have four redundant power supplies. And inside these devices, I might have two supervisor modules, which act as the brains of the device. So you can see we have fault tolerance in the power, fault, fault tolerance in the routing and switching intelligence, fault tolerance in the links between them. Oftentimes, how much fault tolerance you build into your systems is a function of the technology, of course. What does it support? And it's a function of money. So we love this idea of fault tolerance at all layers of the network, but oftentimes it comes down to can we afford it? And even should we pay for it? Because this is going to come down to how much availability do we need? Sometimes we have resources that are not that critical. So we want to weigh this when we're deciding how much we'll budget for fault tolerance and high availability. Is your networking resource there? That's availability. And taking measures like fault tolerance to improve availability can lead to high availability.
Fault tolerance is going to be limited, as we discussed, by the technology that we're using and oftentimes by the budget we have to implement that fault tolerance. Did you ever hear the expression, two heads are better than one? Well, just as equally true is two networking devices or networking components are better than one. In this, let's take a look at load sharing and load balancing. Doesn't it make sense to have multiple network resources and then share the load that might be coming in across those resources? In this example, I have servers shown here, but keep in mind, this could be any networking component. I mean, you might have a DHCP, a single DHCP service doling out the IP addresses that are needed in your enterprise, but it would make sense to use two or three or four and share the load between them. And another aspect of load sharing in networking is load balancing. Wouldn't it make sense if you have multiple network components to balance, not just share, but balance the load between them so you have increased availability and increased reliability at the same time. You'll note that there are many technologies that automate the load sharing and load balancing. Nick teaming is an example where we could have some key server in our organization and that server could have two or more network interface cards. Oftentimes, one of them will be active and the other one will be standby or passive, and the active one is sending the traffic and receiving the traffic, and the passive one is there and can kick in if there's any failure with the active one. Some NIC teaming arrangements are superior though, and they'll be active-active where both of the NICs can be sending and receiving traffic. Now, when it comes to network links in our organization, we know there'll be key links between routers and switches and between switches themselves and routers themselves. And one of the nice technologies we like to take advantage here is called port aggregation. Let's you and I take a look at an example of port aggregation in action. Here I have a little topology built inside of Cisco's Viral product. The Viral product allows you to emulate Cisco equipment using virtual images. And in this example topology, I've got two Ubuntu servers connected to two Cisco switches connected to two links. Now what's nice with port aggregation is you bundle these two links together to look like one link. And one of the effects that this has is to make sure that spanning tree protocol doesn't do its job and block traffic from transiting one of these links. So we can begin load sharing and load balancing across the links. So I've got this configuration input on the second switch of those two switches. And really it's just to go into the range of interfaces that I'm going to use gigabit ethernet zero slash one and two and set the channel group to one mode active. This is the local channel group number and it creates what's called a port channel interface for the aggregation. And the mode of active indicates that we're going to be using the link aggregation control protocol, which is an open standard for creating in a dynamic fashion these groupings of ports. If I go over to the other switch, I've input the commands there and we're just waiting to do a no shutdown over here on those interfaces. So let me do that no shutdown. And then what I see is the physical interfaces come up and then the line protocols come up and the port channel interface comes up. So everything is looking really, really happy and healthy now from a port aggregation standpoint. And we could test this aggregation between these two devices by pinging from one of the servers to the other server over this new bundle of aggregated ports. So let me do an IF config on this uh, Linux box. I th think particularly that this is Ubuntu, but we're at 10.005. Let's ping our neighboring server to Ubuntu system across the switches at 10.006. And we can see great ping reachability and great response times across those Cisco switches that now are aggregating their ports together to load balance and load share. 
Another load sharing and balancing approach that's very popular today and is super cool is clustering. Let's say we have these five servers that all have the same resources that we need to make available on the network. One of the things that we can do is we can connect them all together with some high speed media and then we can make them all act as a single device. So they're all independent devices, but on the network line, Logically, they look like one single, super powerful, super fast server. Clustering is available for a wide variety of networking technologies. It's super exciting because of the enhancements that it's going to bring to us in the availability and reliability areas. Just like the Starship Enterprise of Star Trek fame, we tend to need more power when it comes to running our complex networks. On screen here, you can see here is an iPad and it's running the Sunbird Power IQ software. And this allows you to do sophisticated power management for your data center. Notice we can see the power gauge. We can see health scores for our power distribution. Tools like this are very important when it comes to keeping your data center up and running smoothly and to try and minimize the power costs associated with that. Realize too that from a high availability perspective, there's lots that we can do when it comes to power. Even in our small home office environment, we might want to engage and spend some money on a battery backup, an uninterruptible power supply. What we do is we feed this thing power through a connection and then we connect our network devices to it. And if there should be a power outage, the uninterruptible power supply can supply the power from its internal battery backup. This is a nice feature. If we're in a larger environment, we might want to pick up a power generator so that we can create our own power when we need to. Here's a look at a Cisco 7000 series router and notice what it's doing. It has dual power supplies. I have one connected and one not connected, but isn't it nice to know that we could run dual power connections to this and when these routers are configured with two power supplies like that, oftentimes we can combine power to give extra power to the system or we can just have one in like a standby mode waiting to pick up and take over if we should have a failure of one of these power supplies. Keep in mind too that when you have redundant power options inside of your network devices, you can often connect them to different providers of power. This is what we call redundant circuitry and this is great because you could have one power company fail, but you could fail over to the other power company and start using its power. So power is certainly a critical concern when we are designing and implementing our modern networks. And as we've seen, fortunately, there's a wide number of tools that we can use to assist us making sure we're spending correctly and appropriately on power, but also to ensure that power is always available when we need it. Maybe you work for an enterprise that has really mission critical data or network resources, and they're so critical that it would be nice to have another data center with those same resources, with the same data in some other part of the globe. This would certainly help protect against natural disasters. As I record this, I'm in Tampa, Florida, and in 2017, I narrowly escaped two different hurricanes that came dangerously close to my recording studio. Because the budget required for a redundant site could be very, very high, in practice, there tends to be three different ways you could go about this, a cold site, a warm site, or a hot site. Let's compare these by talking about availability and how about reliability and how about time <laughs> art. And so remember availability is our measure of is the resource there or not. Reliability is a measure of, okay, is the resource there and functioning the way we would want it to. And time of course is time. If I could put time in a bottle. So availability with a cold site, 
we really don't have that site turned on and ready to go. The resources that we would need are not at the ready instantaneously if something happens with the primary site that we are operating out of. So for time, I'm going to put long here. With a cold site, it could take a relatively long time to get things online. And also from an availability standpoint there, we suffer a bit because initially if there's a problem with the main site, there is no availability from the cold site. So we'll give this a rating of low. And from a reliability standpoint, if it's not there, it's certainly not performing the way we would want it to. Also, it's worth noting that with a cold site approach, oftentimes all of the resources won't be available ever. So you might in a cold site just have some key resources that are replicated, but many times we see it with a cold site where the company doesn't bother to make absolutely everything available. Now, a warm site would take less time than a cold site to bring online, and that's why we call it a warm site. So we're going to have medium availability here. It takes less time and medium reliability with that site approach. Now, if we have the budget, it would be ideal to have a hot site somewhere out there in the world. The time is basically non-existent. It's a non-problem. Within seconds, we're up and running with this hot site and we would have great or high reliability and high availability. In the perfect implementation, if you will, of a hot site, that site would have every resource, every piece of data from the primary site and it would be fully reliable like the primary site. The ability to afford something like a hot site might seem completely out of reach, but this is a reason actually why public cloud has become so amazingly popular. This is Amazon Web Services we're in right now. And notice that I am in the region right up here. You can see that of North Virginia and inside North Virginia, I have these four different virtual private clouds. I have one that they built for me by default called the default VPC. And then I've got one called WVPC, Site CBT, and VPC Eve. These virtual private clouds all exist in data centers located in the North Virginia, USA region. It is so incredibly easy for me to build a hot site on the other side of the globe. Watch this. I would drop this list of regions. I would go to like Asia Pacific Singapore, select that region, and now I am operating within that region. Notice the latency is going to be a little bit because it is literally on the other side of the world. So once this comes up, notice that we're in the VPC dashboard, the virtual private cloud area for that Singapore region, and I can start building the resources like the virtual private cloud, the virtual servers, anything I need inside of that region. So this ability to span the globe with your resources and have really super high availability and reliability is a compelling reason to look at cloud technology. When it comes to providing high availability, we know that there's pretty expensive options that we could implement. One example of that would be a hot site, a fully redundant site in some geographically distant area that could be brought online almost instantaneously to provide a second copy of network resources. Well, a much less expensive way to go is to back up data. In fact, it's considered so inexpensive and it's so effective that most enterprise level engineers consider backup absolutely mandatory. When it comes to approaches for taking backups of your important data, there are three kind of classic approaches that software can utilize. There is a full backup and the full backup is by far the easiest to understand. So we have all of this data on a system and the full backup will go and grab all of that data, convert it into some highly compressed format and then store it in some type of a file. Notice it is backing absolutely everything up that you tell it to back up. The incremental backup seeks to save time and also save disk space 
for storing stuff that has changed. So it will look at the data and it will say, okay, what's changed since the last backup of any kind? And then it will write that to a much smaller file that takes less time to create. The differential type of backup does something similar. It looks at the data that needs to be backed up and it says, okay, what has changed since the last full backup? And then it writes that to a small file. So note, you have a bunch of options here. If you had some very high speed technology at work, you could just do a full backup like every day. And now when it comes time to restore that information in the event that there was some failure, you would go to the very last full backup you took and that's all you need to restore. In the incremental approach, you could have quite a bit of restoring to do. Think about it. You have a full backup that you took at some point, and then maybe you did an incremental backup every day, and then you now have to restore. You've got to go in and you've got to restore all of these incremental backups in addition to the full backup. The differential approach is much easier, isn't it? you would be restoring the full backup and then the very last differential that you took would do the job. Students can have a tough time remembering the difference between the incremental and the differential. Just remember, the incremental is grabbing changes since the last backup of any type where the differential is grabbing the changes from the last full backup. Now, when there was a big push to virtualization, a new type of backup technology started really getting popular and that's called a snapshot backup or simply a snapshot. And with a snapshot, what happens is we take a point in time copy of everything that is going on with a system or a file or a set of files. So this is like a full backup. It's just given the name snapshot because it can grab even more information. It could even grab what's in memory at a certain point in time. Snapshots are so valuable in like cloud technologies, oftentimes they're the only backup technology that exists. There is no concept of full or incremental or differential. Now realize that your end networking nodes like a Windows 10 system on the network is going to have built-in backup capabilities just like a Mac that's an end system on your network would. And for that matter, mobile devices have backup strategies. Here I am in the backup facility of Windows 10 inside of settings and notice the first thing that we find when we go into backup is that it needs an external hard drive in order to do a backup. So I've just provided a thumb drive and I've added this thumb drive to the backup system. So if I go under more options here for backup, it sees that it will be backing up to this temp drive and notice it's going to set itself up to back up my files every hour by default and to keep my backups forever. And then it identifies a whole bunch of folders that it's going to back up. This is not really the tool for me. I'm going to turn off automatic backups. I don't like that level of automation that it's doing, especially considering it's backing up things for me unnecessarily. Why is that? Well, because many of the folders that it picked to back up are like my OneDrive folders and my Dropbox folders. I don't need to back those up. There is already a point in time copy of that information. Think about it. With Dropbox, I've got my local files, but they are replicated. They are point in time copied up to the cloud. So there's already two copies. There's no need for me to back that up. Hilariously here, I go back in time to Windows 7's tool, and this is what I would actually prefer to use as my backup solution, because it's going to allow me to go in and set up a backup job like more traditional backup software, and I can choose more easily what it is I want to back up. So I'll say, all right, I have this temp thumb that I want to use, 
and then let me choose exactly what I want to back up. And I could come in here and I could say, all right, I want to uncheck everything that they were going to do. And I'd like to go into the user's directory, my Anthony folder, and maybe I just want to back up all this stuff that's in documents because I'm not replicating that automatically to some cloud service. And in here, I can say, ooh, don't do VMs or virtual machines because these are going to be way too big, along with miscellaneous virtual machine files, to fit on the backup anyways. I'll then say next, now that I've chosen exactly what it is that I want to back up, I'll save the settings and run the backup. So the older tool here gives us much more control, and I prefer it. Now, something that you would want to do, even in your little Windows 10 environment with a networked system, you would want to make sure that you not only set up the backup and think it through as I did, but make sure you also test the restore process. What good is a backup if you can't restore it for some reason? So thoroughly test both the backup and the restoration process before you trust it moving forward. You have so much to consider when it comes to high availability designs in enterprise networking or even for that matter, your small office home office that you might operate out of. In this, I'm going to give you two tools that can really help you. We're going to take a look at the mean time to recovery and also the mean time between failure values. For your high availability processes, you should always be thinking about your mean time to recovery. A great way to think about this is the recovery sites that we mentioned in our nugget on recovery site options. Remember that we had a cold site that we could do, we had a warm site that we could do, we had a hot site that we could do. One of the key differentiators between these sites was how long it would take to be up and operational with that alternate site. And we said that with the hot site, it could be sub-second, really. It's available immediately in its nature. Compare that to a cold site, and the mean time to recovery could be as much as like three days to get that site online. So no matter what you're doing, if it's simple backups, if it's a redundant piece of network equipment that you've got in a closet, always think about the mean time to recovery with that availability solution. The mean time between failures is something that is really important to think about as well. For any device or for any resource, how often is it going to fail realistically? I remember getting the first Mac for my sister-in-law, who was brand new to computing and technology, so I got her the little Mac Mini. And as I record this, it was 10 years ago that I got her that, and sure enough, her hard drive just failed. So it was right about the time I figured it would. When I purchased it, I didn't look up the mean time between failures for the disk drive. I actually could have, but I estimated it at about a decade, and that's exactly about what it lasted. And keep in mind that many networking vendors will publish this mean time between failures so you can accurately plan for it, as accurate as an estimate will be. So here, as an example, is the 800 series integrated service routers. These are good for branch offices, for example. And if we scroll down in the specifications, there is an area for mean time between failure. And notice it says ground benign environment. What this is telling us is, look, this is the mean time between failure as long as you're putting this device in an area where the temperatures, the humidity levels are well within an acceptable range. So they're testing the mean time between failure in a laboratory environment where all of those values that are important environmentally are controlled. If you do something crazy, like put this little device in the oven, <laughs> you're going to have a different mean time between failure. But notice, for the different SKUs, the different exact models of this device, they give us the number of hours that represents the mean time between failures. 
So really think about these important values when you are designing a network recovery and high availability strategy. How long does it take you to get back up and running? And how often might you have to worry about some device or even software implementation failing on the network? Oftentimes when we discuss things like availability in the network, we're thinking about what we'd like to do. We might do a thorough risk versus reward analysis when it comes to availability measures, and then we implement the measures that we think are best. But keep in mind, we might be compelled to do so based on a service level agreement. If we're providing network resources, there's this service level agreement that we have most likely engaged in with our clients, and we have to provide a certain measure. Or reverse the situation. If you're a client of some networking service, you want to make sure you're getting the service level requirements that the vendor stated. Let's take a look at a cloud, public cloud specifically example. This is the Microsoft Azure page for service level agreements. And notice they're going to provide different SLAs for the different components that you might be engaged in with them. For example, let's say that I'm doing storage with them and I want to know what site recovery service level agreements that they're offering me. Look at this. For each protected instance configured for on-premise to on-premise failover, so we go in and we do one of these protected instances and configure it for this level of failover, Microsoft's guaranteeing us at least 99.9% .9 availability for this service. That's pretty impressive. That's three nines of availability, and that calculates to about eight hours a year that we could expect for services to be unavailable when it comes to failover. And I'm betting they'll do even better than that. Now, if we did a protected instance configured for on-prem to Azure planned or unplanned failover for our subscription, then they're guaranteeing a two-hour recovery time objective. The recovery time objective is another nice setting that you should be familiar with. This is Microsoft telling us that, look, on average, it's going to take two hours to get you back and running with that resource. Once again, I bet you would find that Microsoft does even better than that in reality. But these numbers in the service level agreement are just what they're guaranteeing us. So whether you're providing the network resources or you're consuming the network resources, the service level agreement requirements are something that you're going to want to consider very closely as you're thinking about availability. Thanks for watching our second and press the button below, like, subscribe, and bell icon.